Hi there, I'm Dr. Trevor Cates. Welcome to the Spa Doctor Podcast. Today we're talking about how environmental toxins impact our health. This may be something that you think you don't have a problem with, but in fact, we have toxins in our air, water, food, and personal care products that we're exposed to on a day-to-day basis, regardless of where you live. So this is a really important topic because we know these toxins are related to our health and can lead to a number of different chronic diseases. So to discuss this today is my guest, Dr. Walter Crinion. Dr. Crinion received his naturopathic doctorate degree from Bastyr University in 1982. In addition to private practice specializing in environmental medicine, he has taught environmental medicine at all of the U.S. accredited naturopathic medical schools. Dr. Crinion has been a reviewer for multiple scientific and medical journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine. And he is author of the book, Clean, Green, and Lean, Get Rid of the Toxins That Make You Fat. On today's show, we discuss some of the most common toxins in our environment, such as endocrine disrupting chemicals, where you find them, how to avoid them, and what foods and nutrients are the most important to help eliminate these from our body for disease prevention and optimal health. So please enjoy this interview with Dr. Crinion. Dr. Crinion, it's so great to have you on my show. Oh, Dr. Cates, I'm delighted. Yeah, so I we're today we're talking about environmental medicine and I I've, I've learned over the years I've learned so much from you. When I graduated from naturopathic school in 2000, shortly after that I went and did an intensive training with you and I learned so much about environmental medicine and uh, I, I continue to come to your conferences and and listen to you speak. So I so appreciate you having you on and I want to first start with talking about what is environmental medicine. Environmental medicine is really a relatively new field. It's looking at the effect of the, our daily level of environmental chemicals from air pollution, food pollution, water pollution, personal care product pollution, how those adversely affect our health. And it's different than standard toxicology. The standard toxicologists are looking at exposure to a single compound that causes severe damage and possibly death with somebody. That and occupational medicine are looking at like the workplace you know, what's the level of bad things in a workplace that causes somebody so much health problem that they can't work? And that's a different realm than environmental medicine. There is so much information now out there showing that there are levels of the chemical toxicants that every single one of us has rolling around in our bloodstream <clears throat> that actually can be a factor in chronic disease. And it's most of the major chronic diseases. It's not like some rare disease that, you know, 35 people have. I'm talking about all the major things going on for us. Cardiovascular disease, which is the number one killer in the country. Obesity, diabetes, infertility, autoimmunity, chemical sensitivity, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, autism, ADHD, allergies, all these things that people are struggling with. They're not, might not be flat on their back in a hospital, what I call horizontal medicine. They're vertical. It's a vertical medicine problem, but they're not doing well. And so that's what environmental medicine is. It's looking at these levels of, of compounds that don't fit a toxicologist endpoint for you're acutely poisoned. So it's a very different realm. Yeah. And, and like you said, it impacts so many of us. Actually, it impacts all of us, wouldn't you say? It does. It does. And because I, you know, I, I talk about how, you know, there's so many chemicals in our air, water, food, and personal care products that we're exposed on a day-to-day basis, regardless of wherever you live. I mean, certain, certainly more areas, some areas are, you're going to get more exposure than others, but we really are all impacted by it. 
Absolutely. We all have these bad habits. We breathe, <laughs> we eat, we drink. And I get doctors calling me up and saying, well, I've got this patient. I don't know that there's any clear exposure. And my response is, is your patient dead? <laughs> if you know, because we breathe, we have these things. And the Centers for Disease Control has been doing an ongoing trial now um, <clears throat> for probably the last 15, 20 years. It's done nationally. So they get representation, you know, normal residents of the United States throughout the country. It's with the NHANES trial, which is the National uh, Health and Nutritional Examination Survey that's been going on for decades. And they have been started to, to ask the question, how many chemical toxicants are in the average U.S. resident? And they have now tested for approximately 246. 104 are found ubiquitously throughout residents of North America. 104. And these are not, you know, the, these are not, um, they don't work at Boeing making the space shuttle, you know, they, they're not the diesel car mechanics or the crop dusters. You know, this is the average red states of America. They get up, they go to work, they come back and they don't have, a, you know, they're not crop dusters. They're not agriculture workers. Now, certainly some of those will be in the mix, but 104 toxicants in all of us. Yeah. And that's just, they've only tested 246. Yeah. Yeah. And and one of the big components of these are endocrine disrupting chemicals, correct? Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. So can you explain a little about endocrine disrupting chemicals, what they are and where we find them? Well, uh, endocrine disruptors are, as they sound, environmental compounds, mostly chemicals, that impact the way our hormones are made, our hormones are transported, uh, the hormone receptors, the effect of the hormones. <laughs> so it messes up all the hormonal signals in our body, which can be your thyroid for metabolism and weight and energy, can be your adrenals for how well you handle stress, uh, can be your uh, sex hormones, so a woman's um, menses, uh, menopause, uh, ability to conceive, uh, libido, uh, a man's uh, uh, testosterone, libido, ability to father a child, energy, mental well-being. Now, one of the interesting things is the, um, the, the Endocrine Society, which is a group of endocrinologists, they've now been involved in two studies, both in Europe. And in the European study, they said, let's look at five endocrine disrupting chemicals and look at the annual cost, what it costs in healthcare to the populace of Europe for these five. And they did not look at hormonal end product end results. They looked at neurologic end results. When your hormones are off, your brain's off. And these compounds, yes, they're endocrine disruptors, but they also mess up your mitochondria, your ability to produce energy in every cell of your body. They mess up your neurologic system. They mess up your uh, immune system. And yes, they mess up your hormones as well. So, for example, when I started in practice in the early 1980s, I had a lot of young families in my practice. And there were these young women in their 20s couldn't conceive, trying to conceive, I basically cleaned up their diet and got them on multiple vitamins. I had a success rate of 90% where these women after 6, 12 months were able to finally get pregnant. You can't do that now because of the load of environmental toxins. And now we've got men in their 20s and 30s with a testosterone level that you would tip. Before this time, you wouldn't find until they were 60 years old. You know, young men who need to be on, who have clinical hypogonadism because they're breathing air. 
Yeah. So, I mean, this is a, it's a serious issue. Yeah. So with the endocrine disrupting chemicals, where do people, where are they? Can you give us some examples of, of, um, you know, pesticides or, you know, different things that they are? So what's interesting is vehicular exhaust, which is urban air pollution, uh, stuff that comes out of tailpipes that we're all breathing. If you're in an urban area, unless you're like, you're living on a, on a, one of those islands that the people on the survivor shows are living on, you know, <laughs> you know, you're exposed to. So the vehicular exhaust is really, really damaging. Um, and that's something that is, you know, you're living among, you know, in, and that air is inside your home as well. Um, but then something that is more of a lifestyle related issue are the plasticizers known as phthalates. And um, there's two kind of classes of phthalates, the, the ones that are more liquid and the ones that are more solid. And for instance, 100% of fragrances have phthalates in them. And so there have been a number of studies looking at the phthalates, and they're in everybody's urine. And they measure not just one phthalate, but a whole bunch of them. And guess what? Everybody in the United States is peeing out plastic. Now, that wasn't known before this CDC study started going and the government started throwing money at it saying, let's, let's check this chemical. Let's check that chemical. Everybody's peeing out plastics of both varieties, the stuff from the, your personal care products and the stuff from the more solid plastics. Well, that's easy to fix. You choose personal care products without phthalates and within three or four days, that level of phthalates, they're out of your body. Now, the other ones are more difficult because those are from the flexible plastics. So that's shower curtains in your home that are putting off this stuff into your indoor air. That's heating um, your microwave meals with the little plastic cover on them and the microwave safe dish, which only means it won't melt in the microwave. It doesn't mean your food is safe with that. It's eating cheese that's been wrapped in the plastic or the hamburger that all comes in plastic. Um, the other plastic material in the home and vinyl flooring and all that, there's so much plastic material in houses now, you know, and it's considered kid safe because you can, you know, kids can write on the plastic thing on the wall <laughs> and you can wash it off. How great. Um, so these things have been clearly associated with male infertility, female infertility, and obesity. There's now been studies in men, in women, and kids. And the higher the level of phthalates in their pee, the bigger the belt size. So do you think that our our national epidemic of obesity and diabetes is related in in large part or primarily to hormone, uh, these endocrine disrupting chemicals or other chemicals in our environment? It seems to be true. Um, now, for instance, the for diabetes, there's a group of chemicals we haven't talked about yet called POPs, which is persistent organic pollutants. And those are things like the chlorinated pesticides, DDT, or the real bad ones are the polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, which are not even made any longer anywhere on the planet. That's how bad they are. There's a worldwide ban on producing them. They're so biologically persistent, but those are high in farmed salmon and in sardines that people eat millions of tons of farmed salmon a year now. The risk for someone that's got those PCBs in them is like 14-fold greater to develop diabetes. It's not talking like a 10% greater risk or a 25% increased greater risk. It's like 1,400-fold greater risk. 
So these are, you know, real problems. Um, in animal models, you expose animals to high levels of the vehicular exhaust, they become obese and diabetic. So, you know, as our burden is going up, we're having all these problems that in the scientific literature are shown to be caused by these same chemicals that coincidentally are found in everybody. Now, I've been working in this field for a long time and helping people lower their load, and I have seen spontaneous remissions of a huge number of these things. I did, you know, I had a cleansing program in Seattle for a number of years and I had so many people came up and after about three to six months after they finished the cleansing and they were on their maintenance cleansing, they'd come in and say, Hey doc, I haven't changed my diet at all. I haven't started exercising anymore and I've lost 30 pounds. And I say, right on. Don't tell anybody because I didn't want people showing up, you know, oh, you got a weight loss program. No, I reduce the toxic burden. Your mitochondria start working again and then you start burning the fuel. You know, so I've seen this time and time again. You know, when you lower the load, the body heals itself as it's designed to. We just got to get this load of unnatural things out of our body, which is also a distinctive point for environmental medicine from typical alternative medicine, which is looking at what nutrient can I give you that you need to function better. Environmental medicine also asks what compounds do you have in, in you that are suppressing your body's healing ability and let's get them out. So the first step in that is to reduce our overall exposure. So in Absolutely. our personal care products and our food and our um, cleaning products and plastics in the home, things we store our foods and wrap our foods in. So those are all places we start. And one of the things you mentioned was salmon, farm salmon. And I know that I've been asked about the sustainable farming practices, uh, that, that, that salmon that are you know, raised in, in Scottish waters and they get, you know, fed um, special I don't know, food, I don't know, like um, algae and things that they're, they're not high in mercury because they're not eating the other fish. So what do you think about this? Well, well, salmon are not high in mercury anyway. Uh, uh, even wild salmon are on the, the least mercury toxic list anyway. So just don't worry about mercury with salmon. So, um, the salmon are high in these pollutants, these toxicants, because of the fish pellets that they are fed. Uh, they're fed very small little, they, they, you know, get these small little highly oily fish, make them into fish pellets to feed the salmon. And these fish, like the sardines and herring, are all very high in PCBs. Very, very high. And this has been well studied throughout the planet. What's interesting um, is the salmon in the Scottish salmon have the highest level of these PCBs in them. And I just reviewed, I have a monthly uh, subscription podcast called Crinian Opinion, where I review recent articles in environmental medicine. And I just a few months ago reviewed one um, that's the headline said, you know, uh, salmon, you know, the, the farm salmon are less toxic now than they used to be, including what the abstract said. Well, I, it was done by this group, uh, and I couldn't find really who funded them on, you know, doing a web search. Uh, but it, sent, it was a very impressive sounding foundation. And when I read, actually looked at the statistics in the article, that the these persistent pollutants, the, the worst PCBs, the levels had not gone down in the salmon. What they have done is they've started adding other compounds in the fish pellets, uh, you know, uh, grains, vegetable matter. They've added that in and they're saying it's now healthier. But the bottom line is these nasty PCBs are not dropping at all. So that is basically industrial baloney. Now, in 2009, I wrote my book, Clean, Green, and Lean, 
Yes, that takes people step by step through their diet and their home how to reduce their toxic exposure. And in the book, I went and got statistics for the how much farm salmon is being sold over each year and the rate of diabetes over the same period of time. And I got the two graphs side by side. It's mind blowing to look at. Huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk because I know people right now are just overwhelmed and scared probably <laughs> watching probably. this. Don't uh, despair. Don't, don't despair. despair. Okay. So we've reduced our overall exposures by doing some of the things that we've talked about. And then what about nutrition? What can we do? What can we do with our diet, with supplements to help our, to help support our bodies? Well, here, here are the big things, you know, after you've uh, cleared out the exposure and for me, that includes taking care of your indoor air. So you get one of those companies in to suck all the dust out of your ducts because most of these air pollutants are attached to the dust. You start paying uh, 15 to 20 bucks a piece for the high quality pleated electrostatic air filters to keep more dust from coming into your, your HVAC. And then you get, you know, you spend a thousand bucks on a high quality air purifier that can force all the air in your house over time through a series of filters that grabs out even very, very teeny things. It it turns out the teeniest particles are the most damaging. That in itself, turns out, could help women become fertile and have a child that's not autistic. Wow. That's worth the money. Um, So the air you got to take care of the air in the house. You can control the air in your home. Very, very important. And then dietarily, while well, you're looking at avoiding the dirty dozen fruits and vegetables, the Environmental Working Group has their dirty dozen, their shopper's guide. You avoid that because those are organophosphate neurotoxic pesticides. Don't want those. Um, eating a diet that probably the healthiest diet is more of a Mediterranean-style diet. Um, but you have to have a lot of the whole fruits and vegetables and grains because that feeds your microbiome, which is critical in this whole process. Having a more vegetable based diet means your urine is more alkaline. And if your urine is acidic, you recycle all the toxicants, you just suck them back in. So getting a, a more of an alkaline pea which is mostly diet-based, is very, very important. And then for the nasty pollutants, the PCBs and those things, there's some things that help actually clear them out of the body, which they don't normally clear out very well on their own. That's why they're persistent pollutants. They stay. The half-life in the body is 15 years. That means after a salmon meal, 15 years after your salmon meal, your level of PCBs is 50%. 15 years after that, it's 25%. 15 years after that, it's 12.5%. Well, that's 45 years. How old are you now when you're going out and eating farm, eating Scottish salmon? You know, so you want to get those out quicker. Green tea, all the green vegetables, the chlorophyll from the green vegetables, and brown rice, rice bran fiber. Those are consistently shown to increase the excretion out of the body. And I cover all this research in the Clean, Green, and Lean book. So, uh, Walter, you're talking about uh, brown rice. And right now, it seems like a lot of people are steering away from grains. Uh, So what do you think about that? A lot of people are trying to go grain-free or they're even avoiding rice. What do you feel? How do you feel about that? Well, you know, the... There, there was been a diet around for decades now called the macrobiotic diet, right? Which was eat, eat, eat brown rice every meal and you have seaweed and these other vegetables, all the quote high arsenic stuff. There are so many stories of people with cancer, their bodies riddled with cancer that got better on the macrobiotic diet. You know, Dr. Sherry Rogers wrote a book 20 years ago called The Cure is in the Kitchen, which is macrobiotics to reduce your toxic load. So 
um, I am not a proponent of avoiding all those. Um, now, the, the Mediterranean diet, which has, if you start looking at diets in the medical literature and you see the ones that are associated with the greatest longevity, least disease process, you, you keep coming back to the Mediterranean diet, which has moderate grains, not high grains, moderate grains. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> there, there's definitely fiber in them too. So that, yeah. There's that and, one. and, you know, again, we're looking at the, we now know that the microbiome, the bacteria in the gut is so crucial for health and disease. It can move you either way. And that microbiome is predicated completely on your diet. Well, 80% on your diet. I mean, if you take antibiotics, you know, or you get a food poisoning, it's going to shift stuff. But you can start changing your microbiome within 24 hours by changing your diet. And, and so you got to give them the fiber that they feed on. So if you start eating a lot of the high fat diet, the um, what's that new uh, paleo diet, right, or the ketogenic diet, you're putting more of the fats in there, then you change the microbiome because for all the fats that you take in, your liver dumps bile. Those bile acids are not friendly to the real healthy bacteria. So you start shifting to bacteria that are bile acid resistant. And you know, we know the long-term effects of that. You know that that's that's clear, right? And so the the gut microbiome we we t we t I'll talk about this a lot because it's so important for our overall health and for our skin health and skin microbiome. And there's all this connection. How does the gut microbiome play into detoxification and helping us with eliminate toxins? Hugely, it's got a huge connection in there. When um, there's been a resurgence. Maybe it's just because I'm looking more now, but in the met uh, thing called endotoxicity, uh, metabolic endotoxemia, which is uh, gram negative cell wall, bacteria cell walls that get move into the bloodstream. The higher the fat diet you have, the more of those toxins, endotoxins, make it into the bloodstream causing inflammation throughout the body, knocking out your liver's ability to metabolize chemicals, which people call biotransformation or detoxification. It's phase one, phase two, phase three. These endotoxins knock it out. The healthy microbiome, high bifidobacteria that produce a thing called butyric acid, totally shift that. So... If you have the right microbiome, you clear out toxicants, you don't have the body inflammation, you don't have the pro-inflammatory situation. So they are, they are critical for proper functioning, you know, for reducing your total body load. And, um, you know, I've done, a part of cleansing, I've done colonics on people forever, which talk about changing their skin. Oh, my goodness. It's huge. But I think that the, what the colonics are really doing is reducing endotoxicity. I've come to start to think that that is probably the biggest factor in their health, which means if that is true, then you could end up over a period of time possibly getting the same results with really good microbiome balancing, which is diet. And to get there quicker, you do a short period of time of uh, proper uh, probiotic intake. But if you're taking probiotics and not changing your diet, you heard the term pissing in the wind. It's just, it's not going to do anything because you're going to take these things that are healthy and they're going to get down there and they don't have any food to eat. So they are, aren't going to establish themselves. I used to hear, well, it takes so many weeks for the, the healthy bacteria to establish. Well, not if they can't eat. And it's not like you don't have any of those healthy ones down there anyway. It's just that their levels are so small because 
that your diet can only sustain a small colony of them. So start eating healthy, and then that colony will grow bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You can change this stuff by what you eat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, What about, so definitely avoiding the toxins, changing your diet, those are important. Anything else, and you mentioned colonics, anything else that can help people, because we're all exposed to these toxins, help us on a day-to-day basis clear these out from our bodies? Well, I mentioned the green tea, which is, is very important on many, many levels. Not only does it increase the amount of to- persistent toxicants going the body, but it aids in the whole liver process of um, uh, metabolizing the chemicals to get them out. It enhances all the glutathione functions. Now, there's a couple other botanicals that are very similar. One is curcumin which is turmeric. Uh, you know, it's, it's a popular spice in curry. And that has a lot of the exact same benefits. And interestingly enough, uh, you know, and that's been used forever, you know, by millions, daily by millions of people for, I don't know, hundreds of years, right? Uh, one, um, rooibos, Roybo- uh, African honeybush, has many similar qualities, which can be used as a tea. And the herb rosemary has a lot of the same benefits as well. And again, I speak about a lot of these things in the book, Clean, Green, and Lean, which they can get on Amazon. Yeah, great. Well, Dr. Cunyon, thank you so much for your information. Can you tell people how they can learn more about you, how they can find you? Um, and, and, and you have, you still are doing certification courses for practitioners as well Correct. as you have a book for the public. So where, whatever per, a person's background is, you've got something for them. <laughs> Correct. Correct. So, yeah. And I've got two websites. One is just drcrinion.com, which is more for the lay public. And then Crinion Opinion, uh, which is more for practitioners. And that's where the Crinian opinion, where I have information about my training program and my monthly subscription podcast. And of course, uh, Clean Green and Lean is on Amazon for anybody to purchase. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Crinian, for your interview today, all the information you've shared. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this interview today with Dr. Walter Crinion. To learn more about Dr. Crinion and his book, you can visit my website, thespadoctor.com. Go to the podcast page with his interview and you'll find all the information and links there. Also, while you're there, I invite you to join the Spa Doctor community on my website or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes so you don't miss any of our upcoming shows. If you haven't done so already, I highly recommend you get your customized skin profile at theskinquiz.com. It's free based upon the answers to just a few questions. You'll get your own customized report. It's theskinquiz.com. Also, don't miss out on the latest tips for glowing skin and vibrant health. Follow me on Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and Instagram, and join the conversation. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.